Hi, folks. Uh, welcome to Wednesday's iWrite Radio podcast, uh, stroke video cast. Today was First Minister's Questions. She got 10 minutes to kick off with um, the daily list of terrible things that are happening to people um, and then went into questions fairly quickly. Um, what did you think, Stuart? No. Um, they, she didn't announce anything particularly uh, staggering. There is a trend downwards, and that's fine. Um, Jackson Carlaw asked about care homes. Richard Leonard asked about care homes. Um, Jackie Bailey asked about care homes. She was the most venomous, but then she is. Uh, I don't think they got any traction with their care home questions. I was surprised that nobody had a go at Jack, that uh, not even a backbench SNP member had uh, managed to say something about Jackson Carlaw, uh, not saying anything about Dominic Cummings. However, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I didn't hear, didn't know as much to talk about, to be honest. It wasn't very exciting, uh, First Minister. And I'm literally in the middle of a podcast. <laughs> it's nothing like keeping it topical, is there? Um, right, right. That was that was my broker to tell me that I've lost all my money. Oh well, no, no again. Um, no. What was outstanding, I think, for me today is that we are definitely back into politics. Both Jackson Carlo and Richard Leonard were doing the hindsight thing. Why didn't you get it right when you didn't have all the information to get it right? I've got all the information now to criticize you. So criticize, criticize, criticize. She took a really good swipe, I thought, at Richard Leonard when she said, right, you're complaining about the decisions we made two months ago. If you want to do that, why didn't you bring up the points that you're criticizing now at the time? In other words, yeah. hindsight, hindsight, hindsight. Yeah. And, um, he, she had to go at him because he used the term flawed government guidance. And she said, you know, if I'd hindsight, as you said. No, exactly. No. If it was flawed, why didn't they have a go at it at the time? Huh. Yeah. And, that, and that's the problem. It's None flawed now. Part, aye, exactly. It's, it's, that's, unfortunately, both Jackson Carlo and Richard Leonard are poor operators. And if this is the kind of standard that dig that they're going to have at the Scottish government, then neither of them ought to be in position for that much longer because it was effectively both of them were swatted aside with single sentences. I think you're right about the one with Richard Leonard and the one with Jackson Carlo, just at the very end, she talked about him hiding away with his head down. And that was enough for to remind everybody that yeah. Jackson Carlo, when push comes to shove and when difficult decisions have to be made, it'd be worse than Boris. He, he wouldn't even be in the fridge. He'd be under the bloody fridge. Well, I, I, do, I do think that there's also an opportunity because casting my mind back, I will have to go, go back and have a look at it. Everybody was agreeing with the policy to unblock beds, which is what this is kind of turning on. Yeah. Everybody thought it was a good idea. Right down to Neil Finlay. I mean... That man's thick as mince. He really is. He, he is Did you thick tell as me why you didn't unblock beds before the pandemic? Are you going to claim it was just about money or was it all about money? Yeah. The Westminster government gave us extra money and allowed us to buy extra beds. You thick ass. I, I mean, it, it genuinely was. You couldn't, we were. The way, that, the way that the virus and the pandemic had operated in Italy and Spain, we wanted to get the old people out of hospitals because we were expecting a massive influx of people into hospital who were infected. Mm -hmm. And we knew at that point that the virus attacks the elderly more viciously than it attacks anybody. So getting them out of the hospitals was a priority. And you're right, every opposition party supported that at that point in time. The, the yeah. other thing is, uh, you know, you do the... Let's, let's slip into a parallel universe. Had we left all these old folk in hospital, 
that people think they wouldn't have died through hospital infection. Yeah, well, that was an awful thing. I think what it's worth saying that uh, the First Minister took the high ground. Um, she stood there and she said, look, leadership means you have to make the tough calls. And um, when she said that, you could see that she just took the stateswoman role. And what else can you say? Everything, everything else, yes, she made, she made. She ran through all the detail about how um, testing, back in the early days, testing people who didn't have symptoms wasn't any point. Even testing people who had symptoms was only 70% accurate. There was massive amounts of uh, reasons why they, it, it happened the way it did. Yeah, and it's also worth pointing out that whilst the opposition parties are busily having a pot at what's happened in Scottish care homes, none of them mention what's happened in care homes in England or Wales. No well, she, she, did, uh, she did have a go at Richard Leonard uh, about um, that they had a similar situation in Wales where your colleagues in charge, she said to uh, right. Richard she, Leonard. She, he talks to the, the First Minister of Wales on probably two or three times a week. Mm. Probably and more often they, than Richard Leonard does. Aye, probably more often than Richard <laughs> Leonard, aye. And the thing is, the Welsh have done a remarkably similar thing to what we've done vis-a-vis -vis care homes. Norrie, just while I remember, it's worth noting, um, on care homes, the West Highland Free Press are today carrying allegations from a whistleblower about that care home in Skye. They have specific allegations, although the whistleblower's anonymous at the moment. But as you pointed out many, many times, management did not follow the guidelines and guidance given to them by the Scottish government. And the management of that place may well face charges for criminal negligence, I think, well, given what's in the paper the day. I don't want people to go away from watching us thinking that I've got it in for the management of care homes. No, but no. It's blatantly obvious to me that at the very basic level, care homes are not hospitals. They are not designed for isolation. Are they not? You know, I mean, I thought, yeah, but wait a minute, no, numbers no. of care homes are just big old houses. Yeah, but oh, they are. Well, that's probably true. But no, no, no I mean, there are you, modern no, You've told us often enough that they they've got a lot of experience of doing isolation in care homes because they're always having, cor not coronavirus, E. coli or, or vomiting. Yeah, they, yeah vomiting but, bugs and flu. And all that. So they've got lots of experience handling isolation. But that, but is, that a is a different time. level of isolation. Sorry, Jimmy. Hi, sorry, this is a million times worse. It, it's, I think they tell you it's eight times worse, eight times more easily transmitted than flu, for example. So they just weren't set up. And even when they were handed piles of PPE by the Scottish government and very, very succinct and strict guidelines on how to operate, some of them weren't doing that. That's not the staff's fault. The staff don't have the training to do that. That is the operator's fault for not providing that training. Well, step through it. The only, the only way to deal with this is isolation. Hmm. That's it. Um, you get it, tough to you try to stop that being passed on to other people. Well, that takes us to... homes are not designed for it. They obviously didn't have the PPE that they needed. The private care homes should have been supplied with it. The corpy care homes should have been supplied by the councils with it. Well, but it's fair you know, enough, but to some extent, we can't blame it all on the care homes because if, uh, nobody was expecting a virus that's this infectious and this easy to transmit. No, I'm, I'm, that is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there are mitigating circumstances. Well, that's what I'm trying homes. to add in. But if there are mitigating circumstances for care homes, the mitigating circumstances for the government is they're much, much higher. They're not responsible. Mm. The people well, on the ground in the management of care homes are the people who are ultimately responsible. You, but you, you'll never convince a Richard Leonard or a Jackie Bailey of that. They just desperately desperately need to blame the SNP because even as bad as the Tories are, they're still sitting in second place in the polls for the Scottish election next year. Well, um, let, can we move on to the other well, two can I qu just main, main questions? Say, Get off the care homes. Well, the, there is one really pertinent point here. None of the opposition are calling for the Scottish government 
to take responsibility in the future for care homes. Mm -hmm. This is Probably. a blame game. This yeah, is not and about yet, solutions. Well, and yet the Scottish government have announced that they are looking at the structure of care homes in the future. But none of the oppositions, and this includes the Labour Party, let's nationalise everything Richard Leonard, are talking about nationalising the care homes. The Tories can't do it for obvious ide ideological reasons, but the Liberal Democrats, Greens and Labour Party are not calling for a solution. Mm. Take the Greens out of that because they haven't jumped on this bandwagon yet. Mm. The Liberal Democrats will yeah. And the Labour Party are just looking to blame the SNP. They're not looking for the solution. Well, look, uh, that's interesting that because the Greens uh, and, and uh, Willie Rennie for the, the Lib Dems, they actually didn't go in care homes. The Greens uh, brought up an interesting one. Uh, the First Minister announced that we've got test and protect the scheme to test people and isolate people. That, that launches tomorrow or might be Friday, maybe tomorrow. tomorrow. And the, uh, the, Alison Johnson for the Greens was concerned about how people were going to cope with two weeks isolation. Two weeks isolation, that's nothing. However, um, the First Minister got the opportunity to say, well, um, what the, well the, the, if you're worried about that, about being isolated for two, two weeks, just think about it. Don't become a contact. In other words, Keep social distance. Stop going to the beaches and hanging out with all your pals, and you won't become a contact in there, and you won't have to isolate. So she got in. She got in with that one. Mm, uh, I, I, th I think one of the problems is going to be that people think isolation is what we're doing now. They don't. Well, that's not isolation. No, they don't understand. It's not crossing the threshold. Right. You're not going anywhere. You're stuck right. in the house. And if you're the one with it, you're stuck in a room in the house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, the decent thing about that is every, in every part of that announcement yesterday seemed well thought out, seriously well thought through, and we can only hope that the actual programme is half as good as it looks on paper. Well, it would, look, it would appear that the, the UK government is going to launch theirs tomorrow. And we didn't uh, hear about that till this morning. It, it, did they rush for, rush their scheme forward just because they heard the Scottish government were going to be launching before them? Well, I hope they did because their announcement was pish and their scheme's pish so we can get a good laugh at them when it falls apart. I'm sorry, we're already seeing spikes in the south coast because the UK government encouraged people to go out and have street parties on VE Day. I, I thought it was interesting that the Greens were the party that went with uh, you should have kept the, the um, test and trace going. None well, of the unionist parties can go down that route because well, it was the Westminster government that put a stop to it. Let's be, neither can the Greens. How could we possibly? We didn't have the tracers in place to carry on with test and trace. Or the, the laboratories. Greens, all the labs. Aye, we didn't have the testing capacity. The Greens can, it's a typical Green ploy to say you should have done this when the reality of doing that would have cost hundreds of millions of pounds and we weren't in a position to do so at the time. Ah, but they need to have a, a word with uh, Neil fin Finlay so he can tell them where he's keeping that magic money tree that the Scottish government's hiding. Presumably that's why he's standing down for Parliament next year to keep shoveling shite on his magic money tree. Yeah, probably. What else that's came called, up? called dung. Well, what didn't come up was Cumgate. Have you noticed that's what? Well, the, uh, Willie, Willie brought it up. All right, but I, I, I think it's a very appropriate um, hashtag for the Dominic Cummings scandal, Cumgate. Um, no, I don't know. I think anybody sticking gate on the end of something is lacking um, any sort of intelligent thought <laughs> these days. Come on, think about it. Show some imagination instead, particularly when you're using the word cum. And if somebody pointed out that um, Dominic Cummings is distantly related to um, oh, uh, the, the, Barnard, the guy, the, the Lord of Barnard Castle from God knows how long ago. Uh, the news night last night, Emily Maitlison absolutely tore him at least one Aye. other asshole, if not two. 
She destroyed them in what it took her about a minute and a half or so at the start of the program to absolutely. It took her just just over a minute. And guess what, guys? Playing out there. I've got a clip. Oh, very good. Very good. Okay. So here we go. Coming up now. I have to do too many clicks on this now. Questions remaining are many. It is still unclear why Dominic Cummings tested his eyesight by going for a 60-mile drive with a small child. Still unclear why he changed his own blogs to backdate inclusions to suggest he predicted the pandemic. Still unclear why his wife's article about lockdown contained so many apparent inaccuracies. Still unclear why the government would stake its moral authority on the insistence that what happened was fine. <laughs> I think that just about hit every single nail there was. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Fantastic. Of course, um, Dominic Cummings' wife's brother has uh, apparently got links to uh, a Ukrainian gangster who's, on, uh, who's wanted uh, for criminal charges in the United States. You couldn't make this story up. John Le Carre couldldn't write a better plot. And bringing in Barnard Castle is, is genius. Apparently, it's been, it's been designated... Uh, a sacred site after thousands of blind pig pilgrims are miraculously cured over the last 24 hours. Mm. <laughs> and whose, sister, whose sister is it that's involved with the app? It's his, that Dominic's and his wife? Oh, Dominic's sister. I, I mean, we talked about this earlier and I, we'll give you a wee heads up here, folks. We're going to start looking at the various things that the government's been doing under the radar. The, uh, they've thrown the farmers to the wolves. The companies that they're given contracts to without any scrutiny in parliament, etc., etc. So because it's kind of been ignored because of the Dominic Cummings thing, each day I think we're going to take one particular subject and just have a look at it and see what they're up to. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Because... The other thing that came up at FMQs that we briefly touched on was the fact that the Westminster government is now not giving the Scottish government 70 million in Barnet consequentials. That 70 million has already been promised by the Scottish government to be paid out to, amongst other people, charities. Yeah, there's about 10 million for charities and 60 million that's meant to be spread around, I think it was mostly business grants and that, mate, but... Well, this, this uh, Manchester are kicking up about this as well, because they got 54 million for that business small grants, and it works mm -hmm. out at 600 pound per qualifying business. <laughs> Good, that's all sad, keep on the lot and go in with it. And it seems to be that Richie has decided, rather than embarrass themselves, by only giving six hundred pound to companies, um, he's just going to pull the scheme. But that, I mean, that's outrageous. You know, I mean, yeah, it's will. like it's like me promising you a bonus for Christmas. You go out and buy the Bairns presents, and I decide you're not getting the bonus, so you can't even feed yourself. Mm -hmm. Ah, it's just, it's a nice wee bit of what is Indian given they call. It, I suppose I shouldn't call it that, given Sunak's um, very sweet. Oh, I don't know where he's pretty, but his, his race is Indian, I think. Oh, oh, oh. There is a big difference. There's a big difference where you're from and what your identity is. I have to tell you about Indian giving. That's Eskimos, actually. And what yeah, well. you, if you give them a pen, they've got to give you a motorboat. And when they give you the motorboat, you've got to give them a house. No, I went from it yourself. Just, just didn't give them a pain. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting, basically, it's communism. All right. Well, can I wind this back to what just might be going on and whether this Dominic Cumming, Cummings of scandal, where it started, or could it possibly just be a big dead cat? Well, it seems to have legs of its own. There is something real there. But my God, we're not talking about what, what where's the Russia report? Well, that's another one of these under the radar things. Russia report, Pretty Patel's uh, bullying inquiry has disappeared. 
you know, the wrote off uh, Boris's girlfriend, the American girlfriend, that got all this money. That's been shredded. That, at least that's been mentioned. Yeah, well, oh, there's been no headline about the police shredding information. We've talked about American trade, likely deals being signed, secret deals and secret courts. Well, the deal's going to be secret for five years. You're not going to get to see the deal for five years. And every day is another NHS contract or another contract put out to some friends or other of uh, Dominic Cummings and his government. So is it Serco or Deloitte that have got the contract for the testing? I think it's Serco, mate. I would, I, I, off the top of my head, I'm sure it's Serco because Deloitte were involved in all kinds of other nonsense. But they had something to do with PPE, did they not? Aye, they were, they were um, running the country-wide sourcing of PPE, which is interesting mm -hmm. given that they're accounting firm, but there we go. They have... <laughs> Let's be honest, Deloitte just moved in when, um, oh shit, it's just straight in my head. The big one that went down the tubes last year that was building hospitals and what have you. Was that not Circa? Carillion. 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 When Carillion went tits up, Deloitte just stepped in and mm. took over about 80, look, 90 percent of their operations. Look, Deloitte have been running the, uh, the testing centres at the airports, the drive through ones, but that'll yeah. be separate from the what, what, what's called test and protect in Scotland. What do they call it in England? TTT. Well, Jimmy, you made a good point about who is responsible for the testing down south. Well, it's, down south it is. It's, it's private companies that are responsible for it and they've employed 27,000, I believe is the number, but half of these people aren't yet trained because the online training system didn't work. Up here, it's all NHS staff. It's all being run through the NHS and the 660 contact tracers we have working at the moment are employed by the NHS. The 750 that are ready to go, as far as I know, are employed by local authorities and the NHS. And then if we need more, again, it'll all be publicly owned. Is, staff is that are doing this, it's not private. <coughs> Excuse me. Is it normally, not normally a council responsibility? Well, it's local, it's health boards that are health going to do it. and local authorities are running it, mate. So what's the tie-up? Because food poisoning is actual local authority, isn't it? They have guys that go around and check restaurants and whatever. Well, I'm sure they all tie together if it's an ep epidemic. But at, at the moment, it's 14 health boards have been given the responsibility for the test and protect. It does seem there was a, a woman, I don't know who she was, but she was on Radio 4 this morning a Scotswoman talking about what they're doing in Scotland. And it does seem that it's much more local in Scotland. But well, that's, it's, it's the only way that it works. That's why Newsnight done the expose of bloody doctors in England doing it for themselves when it wasn't getting done weeks and weeks ago. You have to employ local knowledge. You know, they ha if somebody becomes a contact, you have to be able to speak to their doctor their GP and other people's GPs, it all has to tie together. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, I mean, seriously, taking a big centralised company, taking the approach that England's taken, could very well be a recipe for disaster because it's untried. This works. Testing and tracking and contact tracing works. We've been doing it for bloody decades when it's been mm -hmm. food epidemics, or sorry, food poisoning or minor epidemics. Mm -hmm. So this is a system that we know works. England are taking a massive gamble by going, Let, hold it, wait a minute, let's hand a massive amount of money to one of these big international conglomerates and hope they can come up with a system. It's worse and, than that, Jimmy. Jimmy, it's worse than that because they, they don't, no need to centralise all this data. They're not centralising this data in Scotland. But coming back to the possibility of contracts going out under the, under the table without any scrutiny, all this data that they're gathering will almost certainly go to some private contractor once it's gathered. They already well, has. They've already sold most of his bloody data. Is it not going to one of the <laughs> farmer countries? You know, these pharmaceutical companies that are basically richer than most countries in the in the world. 
Well, what about this app? What about this app that we're trying out in the Isle of Wight? Wasn't that another relative of Dominic Cummings? Uh, uh, is it not his sister that's involved in it at some level? His sister's I, a director of the company that are running at IDOX. IDOX. His sister, right. His sister okay. was registered as a director. Weirdly, people have tried to say that she was registered as a director on the same day that he came back from London. I'm not certain of that because I'm sure the story's older, but maybe I'm wrong. There's nothing like keeping it in the family. Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely. I mean, as I think I said yesterday, one of my big fears about this stushy with Cummings is it gets to the point where the government simply doesn't communicate any information to the media. So um, can I ask, uh, is the Prime Minister being questioned by this committee, liaison committee, is that today? Yeah, for, uh, I think. I think it's this afternoon now. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm, we're talking about stuff going under the radar. We might get overtaken both by that, um, what's it called? It's something scrutiny committee, isn't it? Liaison committee. I think it's the head of, uh, it's the committee where you've got the head of all the other committees. Yeah, all the other chairs tend to All the other that. chairs come together, he's, yeah. He's hardly uh, going to get a roast in for Bernard Jenkins, though, is he? Well, Bernard Jenkins can be fairly, he's, he's, he's usually quite pleasant when he eviscerates somebody. Um, Not he. There's only, there's, there are only like 20 he's, minutes he's on Cummings. He's still a Tory. And given the week that Boris has had, Bernard Jenkins will have a nice big fat back pocket to absolutely go easy on him. And he's still a Tory, mate. He'll take a bung. And they're only doing 20 minutes on each topic. And then they can use up the time just by blethering rubbish. Well, the, the other point is that not everybody that's on the committee is going to be there. Aye, uh, we've got the... Committee, so I don't know. Pete yeah. Wishart's... He'll be remote. Aye. Aye. Um, Aye, and let's um, be honest, if, after his display on the Scottish Committee, I didn't ken why we expect anything for Pete Wisher. No. That was one of the most sycophantic, arse-licking disgraces I've ever seen. And I pointed that out to him on Twitter, and weird, weirdly, he didn't block me. <laughs> well, well, I had a go at De Deirdre, uh, our local uh, MP, about that. She, appeared, she, she, she had a question. It was noticeable she, later in that afternoon she appeared on another committee, I think it's a trade committee, and she was quite assertive in her question on that committee. You have, I mean, one of the problems is with, you, can't, you can't just wade in because effectively they just don't answer your question. And I've noticed it on these committees that you have to be, you have to kind of wheedle the answer out. You have to go from a, a direction they don't see you coming from quite a lot of the time um, or they just blank you or they hand it over to the civil servant to take the roasting. Um, it, it's not as straightforward. It's not a great system. I mean, the American no, system where you're basically in front of a jury of senators who are all looking to eviscerate you is a much better system for getting to the truth. Certainly, um, uh, there was only one per one person ever got the better of them, and well, who was that? Oh, George Galloway. George Galloway did a good job with them, actually. Yeah. Yeah. How hey, we just sat there and been, we just sat there and we talked about being a smart ass, pointed out to them how stupid they were. He didn't actually do a great job. He dressed it up as doing a great job, and the British media agreed with him. But let's be honest, he sat and told them a pack of fucking lies. Sorry <laughs> for the language, but he did. He sat and told them a pack of nonsense. Just they were too stupid to work out what he was saying. An American senators, for God's sake, it's not like they're clever. They don't know any Scottish accents, of course. Um, anything else come up at FMQs? Mm, not really. No? It was quite disappointing. Oh, there was the oil question, wasn't there? Oh, that was just him being an idiot. I forgot could his you, name now. Could you test people who might have the coronavirus with tests that won't tell us if they've got the coronavirus. Oh, this... uh, typical Tory. Liam Kerr, that was it. Liam I'll, bet Kerr. That, I'll bet you these oil companies test all the directors. It's just well, the he's, workers. He's, that don't he's, he's asking for asymptomatic testing for workers. Asymptomatic testing is going to cost a fortune. Why are we going to get to private to oil companies? workers? 
I, I mean, I'm sorry, but oil companies all make money. I've never heard of an oil company that doesn't make money. Let them pay for their staff testing. And asymptomatic testing is kind of a waste of time. And we've been told it's kind of a waste of time for an awfully long time. It's actually amazing the amount of responsibility that the Tories want the Scottish government to take for private companies. Aye, aye, it's, it's very communist given that they're Tories, but during a, during a pandemic, suddenly they want the government to be responsible for everything. Yeah. What is it, that phrase that we've mentioned before? Socialising problems and privatising profit. Yeah, yeah, well, that's what they did with the banks, isn't it? Mm. Mm. So has, there, has anybody ever worked out how much of a bank we all own now? <laughs> I shouldn't worry about it now, unless you live in Iceland. Uh, hey, if you live in Iceland, you you need to know that because you maybe that, maybe that's a, maybe that's the solution to the problem that people are having problems that people are having as to whether public toilets should open again when we open up. You know, when lockdown is eased, maybe they just open the banks and we can all go and take a dump on the flare. That's my share. Somebody can clean up. Oh, Jimmy, nasty. I've got, I've, got, I've, I've got that picture in my head now, Jimmy. I've, I've got some news for you. Uh, this is hot off the press because the, the email just came in about half an hour ago. Ofcom have announced that they're licensing, they're, they're tempor bringing out temporary licensing for radios for drive-in movies and worship. Drive-in worship. So that the they're gagging to get back into their churches and sing hymns, of course, and pray to God that they're all going to be cured, but they're not allowed. So they're, they're licensing drive-in worship ceremonies. There'll be a car park down at Asda, and they'll all be lined up in their cars and they'll listening on their car radios to the, the minister. Far away. I'm far more entertained by the idea of drive-in gigs, where you've got a couple of decent bands up and you can drive up in your motor. Can they not just all walk out on the top of the fourth and no, socially only distance? The, only, the, only the sky pal can walk on water. They just believe that he can. All right, okay. <laughs> I, I take it we're all atheists, eh? Um, <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a clip here to finish off with, which is... Um, What's his name? Tony Blair's spin doctor. Oh, Alistair Campbell. Is that the good one? Interviewing Matt Hancock a few Oh, that's a ago. cracker. Oh, that's uh, a cracker. And he's interviewing him about what he thinks of Boris Johnson. So I, th I think we'll finish with that. It's, it's You've got to look carefully. Dumb. Look carefully at Matt Hancock's eyes. Well, just look at the expression on his face when he tries. Well, he doesn't answer the questions except with his facial expression, truth told. <laughs> so uh, I think we'll call it a day at that, guys. Um, thanks for listening, folks. Cheerio. Um, and we'll see you all tomorrow. Thanks, Jimmy Hutton, Stuart Lockhead, and Norrie Stewart. And we'll play out with this clip, uh, if I can find it. There we go. What is it like in there at the moment? When Boris Johnson gets off his plane from Kabul and wanders in with his ridiculous hair and his ridiculous manner and all his ridiculousness, and he's the foreign secretary, what, do you not, not just sit there thinking, how the hell is he still there? <laughs> That's a yes, you do think that. Well, you know, each person brings a different thing to the table, don't they? And around that table, there's some absolutely brilliant people who are he's pulling together to try to make it all work. He's definitely not one of them. Eyebrows lifted. You see, that's why sometimes it is better on camera. In print, I'd have had to say, eyebrows, eyebrows raised. What is it like in there at the moment? When Boris Johnson gets off his plane from Kabul and wanders in... Sorry, guys. I've made a mess of that. No, you didn't. We needed to be reminded. <laughs> Uh, Enjoyed that. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. Anyway, we'll call it a day at that, and we'll catch you all tomorrow. Cheers, folks. Cheerio.